get into it? Are you sure you're ready to get into it? Man, we got into it in the first service, so I just want to know if you're ready to get into it, because this is going to be a, it's going to be an interesting day. It's going to be an interesting day. Uh, has been so far. So we're in a series called uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, and the first week we talked about Holy Spirit vindication. The fact that the Holy Spirit had been silenced in our territory for quite a while. Uh, that spirit filled, that full gospel, that charismatic churches had come and gone. Uh, but this was a time for us to rise up and say we want the things of the Spirit. The second week we talked about Holy Spirit simplification. In simplification, we talked about the fact that the Spirit comes to seal and indwell the believer uh, at the point of belief. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, Jesus told the uh, disciples to go wait in Jerusalem until they already had the Spirit, but until the Spirit came upon them with power, uh, reminded them that uh, John told them that they would be baptized in the Spirit. Then we talked about Holy Spirit separation. Those things that grieve the Spirit, those things that separate our relationship, that create a separation. And last week we talked about Holy Spirit transformation, talking about the way that Peter went from a guy making a lot of mistakes uh, to a guy with a healing power, miraculous power, after the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to talk about Holy Spirit verbalization. Yep, we're going to talk about tongues. We're going to talk about tongues. And so if you're here this morning and you were not raised in a charismatic environment, some of what I say may be a struggle for you, but I'm going to show you in Scripture. If you're here and you were raised in a charismatic environment, some of what I say may be a struggle for you, but I'm going to show you in Scripture. This topic of tongues is very widely misunderstood in the church. It creates great division. It creates fear in a lot of people. Uh, and tongues are widely silenced due to religion and control, control in the church. And, and so uh, part of the reason this is such a difficult topic is there seems to be almost directly controversial scriptures about it, things that contradict themselves. Things like tongues are for the common good, but tongues is speaking to God, not to man. Things like tongues must have interpretation, but Paul says, I pray in tongues. And Jude says, pray in the spirit all the time. Uh, there's scriptures that say tongues will cease. And yet Paul says, I wish that you all spoke in tongue and do not forbid the speaking in tongues. So we got to go find out what's really going on on this topic because what happens today in many churches is we cherry pick the scripture that makes it most comfortable for us in our church. Uh, we go through and we grab the clubs is what I call them. The clubs that we can hit people with to make sure they stay in line with what we want to do. And, and there's a real danger, such a danger in looking at a scripture and not referencing the character of God. Because what will happen is you'll take a scripture out of context and you'll miss what he has for you because you're overemphasizing something in a particular scripture. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Do you know that neither Jesus nor Paul could have been a deacon in the church? Because if you look at the scripture, it says a deacon must be the husband of one wife. And since neither were married, then I guess they can't be deacons, but you would have missed the opportunity to have Christ to serve. So we have to look at what is the context, what is he trying to teach about, instead of just pulling a line out and trying to use it. So what we want to do today is first clarify some things that I'm going to say in advance may cause some tension with you, but I'm going to show you in Scripture what I'm saying by that. The first one is, there are tongues today for the purpose of praying. Tongues for prayer. There are also tongues and interpretation today, which is a gift of the Spirit for the common good of the church. So let me say that. Tongues for prayer and the gift of tongues and interpretation for the common good of the church. And I'll show that to you. I believe that all believers can pray in tongues. If you don't, don't stress about it. But I believe we can because our spirits have been regenerated. They've been brought to life. They've been brought into the kingdom. We now have life. We were once dead in our trespasses and sin, but now we're made alive in Christ and the spirit 
praise. But not everybody has the gift of tongues and interpretation. Secondly, I want to remind you in this conversation that you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. The body, this physical thing that we look at each other in. The soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, the things that make you, you, and me, me, apart from what we can see. Then we have a spirit. God breathed the Ruach breath of life into man, and he became a living soul. He had a spirit, and that spirit is what man lost in the garden. And when man is born into this earth, he's born under the prince of the power of the air, and so his spirit is not alive. But when he comes to know Christ, his spirit is brought to life. So you have a spirit in you. The scripture will show you that the spirit can pray. The spirit has a language, if you will. So let's jump straight into scripture with those premises and see how this comes out. I'm in 1 Corinthians 13. Most of you know this. I want to start with the people in the room that believes tongues have ceased. These miraculous things have ceased, and so there is no tongues for today. Let me show you in scripture what's used to teach that and why I don't believe it's an accurate teaching. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, it'll be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it'll be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then... Face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, and the greatest of these is love. So this is one of the scriptures used to say that tongues doesn't exist anymore. We don't have this in the church today because it says right there that prophecy and tongues and knowledge, at least at a minimum, will cease. But remember, it says when the perfect comes. When the perfect comes is when those things will cease. So the argument has been used that the word of God is perfect in every way. So the perfect word of God, when the word came, there was no longer a need for these gifts. Two things to think about when you think about that. First of all, what you currently have as a New Testament those 27 books that have been assembled, those were not assembled and finalized as Holy Spirit-inspired truth, good for teaching, reproof, rebuke, all of those things for the believer until 397 A.D. in the Council of Carthage. So that Bible wasn't even assembled as the 27 books you have today for 400 years. And so those who would say, well, when the Bible came, it's the perfect word. Therefore, we don't have tongues anymore. That didn't happen until 400. So you believe that tongues ceased in around 400 uh, and that that Bible replaced it. But let me show you three proofs in this text, this scripture we just read, that show you that's not the accurate interpretation. Are you ready? Okay, the same writer of Corinthians is the writer of Hebrews. Paul wrote them both. Now, he wrote one as a Jew and one to the Greeks, so they have a different writing style, but we believe Paul wrote both of those. In the book of Hebrews, five times Paul refers to Jesus as the perfect. In Hebrews 5, 8 and 10, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things with he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all of those who obey him a source of eternal life, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews 7, 28, for the law appoints men as high priest who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Hebrews 2, 10, it was fitting for God to perform Perfect the author of salvation. Hebrews 5 9, Hebrews 12 2 talk about fixing our eyes on the perfecter of our faith. So the first evidence that the perfect is not the Bible, that the perfect is Jesus, is the writer has been referring to the perfect as Jesus in other writings. The second thing to look at is it says, when the perfect comes, if you look in verse 12, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, when is the then? When the perfect comes face to face. Now, no offense, but I can't actually be face to face with my Bible. 
I can be face to face with Jesus but I can't actually be face to face with my Bible. It's a reference to the fact that we're going to be face to face with Jesus. Third, it says, now I know in part, but then when the perfect comes, I will know fully just as I've been fully known. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've had the Bible all my life and I've been reading it since I was probably six years old. And in the 50 years I've been reading it, I don't know everything. I don't fully know, but this scripture says when the perfect comes, if it's a scripture, I'm going to fully know. It's got mysteries in it that I know are still there waiting for me. So I don't fully know because the scripture is here, but when Christ comes, I will fully know. Prophecy will be fulfilled. Knowledge will be exposed. Communication, I believe, is going to return to the way it was in the garden. When God walked with man in the garden, there was a communication, there was a conversation, there was a language. And we know that at the Tower of Babel, that language got split all over the earth. And I believe there's going to be a restoration of that language that they spoke in the garden for all men. But my point is, it cannot be the Bible because the Bible doesn't fit the description he's saying. But it totally makes sense if it's Jesus is the perfect that comes. In other words... I will not need to speak in tongues when Jesus returns because we'll have a pure language. I will not need prophecy. It's been fulfilled. So there's no reason for the gifts to continue after Christ has returned. So that reference to when the perfect comes is talking about when Christ returns. See, Paul says, right now in this earth, I'm a child. I only know things partially. But then when I'm mature, I will know things fully. Therefore, I can put away the things that I used as a child, the gifts. I won't need those anymore because I fully matured in Christ. You with me? All right. The second argument used for these gifts have gone away is something called apostolic dispensation. Now, let me clarify what that means. There was a time when the apostles who were actually appointed by Jesus were on the earth. And some people will argue scripturally that the apostles were starting or launching the church. Therefore, they needed miraculous abilities in order to capture people's attention. Now, I could argue that one all day long because the Holy Spirit convicts the day and he could have convicted the same way he did before with and without the miraculous. Okay, but they're saying that because the apostles could work in those things, that when the apostles were gone, that dispensation ended and the miraculous no longer happens. Here's the problem I have with that line of thinking. First of all, for a dispensation to end, another dispensation has to begin. When the Abrahamic dispensation ended, the Noah dispensation, the Mosaic dispensation, another one began. What began after the apostles died? Nothing. It was the church age from the time that Christ was risen and returned to heaven until now. How do I prove that? In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus is talking to those apostles, and this is what he says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now watch. Teaching them, not you, teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What did he command them to do? He commanded them to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, to raise the dead, to do the miraculous. So all of the things that he taught them, he said, now I want you to go teach the next generation. So he didn't stop it and say, I want you, I'm commanding you to tell them to do all the things I've commanded you, except that miraculous stuff, except the gift stuff, except tongues. We're going to stop. He doesn't say that. He says, teach them all that I've taught you. So I believe that tongues is relevant for today but I believe there's a lot of confusion about it. And this is what I want to do today. I want to take the scary and the crazy off of tongues. Okay? Because I think we need that in the church. I think we need to stop looking at this thing as something weird and something odd, and we need to figure out how this is supposed to work and what its value is because it's been so messed up in the church. So first, as I read Scripture, all tongues are are a language. All tongues are language. Now, you may not know this, uh, but if you went and did a study of how many languages are there on this earth right now, on the earth right now, how many identified languages? You know they've identified 6,500 languages. 
6,500 languages. Now, if I were to sit here and we were to rattle off each of those 6,500 and just say a sentence or two, they would all be very different. They would all be very unique. Some of them are clicking sounds, if you know the, the Congolese language, and some of them are flowing, if you know French. So there's, there's a lot of different languages and types of languages, but everyone communicates a language. Uh, Robert Morris, one of my favorite speakers, uh, demonstrated it this way. He has a two-year-old granddaughter, and he went and sat with a phone and uh, videoed his two-year-old granddaughter, and he asked her a question. He said, what's that look like to you? And she just began saying, I did it behind the baby. And he said, I know, but what are you going to do after that? And he said, okay, but do you have something more to say on that? And he said, here's the truth. I don't have a clue what she's saying, but I know she does. I know there's a language going on there. I just don't know her language. So there are languages that you listen to, listen to me, that are not gibberish. They're languages They're communicating something, but you don't understand them. So let's go look at some scripture to find out why. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, I don't want to learn about tongues. All right, you got it. 1 Corinthians 12. But to each one is given a manifestation, a way the Spirit manifests himself for the common good. Everybody say common good. A manifestation of the Spirit for this purpose, so that the common good happens. In other words, so that we all somehow are edified, we're somehow built up, it's to our favor. This manifestation is given for the common good. Now he's going to give you a list of some of those manifestations. Because to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, and to another kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Now these are gifts, these are manifestations, listen, given for the common good of the church. It's going to be so important in a minute. These are gifts given for the common good of the church. Now listen, they have to go together. What good would the gift of interpretation be if there was no language you didn't understand? So the gift of interpretation always goes with the gift of tongues because it's interpreting what is being said in tongues. So you see those two things together. And Paul begins to talk about this whole conversation in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, if you want to turn there in verse 1, this is what he said. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire the spiritual gifts that he just talked about, especially that you might prophesy. Now it gets confusing. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit, look closely, small s. But in his spirit, he is speaking mysteries. Here's what Paul just said. When one speaks in a tongue, he's not speaking to man. He's speaking to God, and it's his spirit that is speaking mysteries because no one understands what his spirit is saying. Let's keep going. There's a major point here that his spirit is speaking and not his mind and his soul. Paul didn't say a man speaks. He didn't say out of his mind he says. He didn't say he thinks this in his soul. He said his spirit is speaking. It's not in the thought processes. So if you don't believe you have a spirit, this is a real struggle for you because your spirit speaks mysteries. If you have not been born again, if you have not been baptized in the spirit, you may wonder, well, why am I not speaking that yet? And it may have something to do with the status of your spirit. But it says no one will understand what you're saying. Look at three. But the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, for exhortation and consolation. What is he saying? You're speaking in their language. So you can edify them. You can build them up. You can encourage them. But four says, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. What? He speaks mysteries 
from his spirit, but it edifies himself. The speaking in tongues edifies the person speaking in tongues. What is edify? Edify, if you look it up in the, in the Greek, is uh, often it's referenced with building a house. You're building upon building upon building. You're edifying. You're, you're strengthening. You're, you're putting more and more onto it to make it stronger and stronger and stronger. And what he's saying is the person who speaks in tongue, his spirit speaks this mystery and it edifies that person. Uh, for those of you who do, for those of you who don't, when I pray in tongue, it makes a difference in my soul. In other words, I can feel a strength. I know that I'm declaring something. I know that I'm breaking something. I know I'm building myself up by praying in this language. It says, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Common good. Stay with me. Common good. Now, Paul says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. He's telling the church in Corinth, not the apostles. He's telling the church, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. So he's not against tongues for sure, because he's saying, I wish that you all did this. But even more that you would prophesy, greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. Now, if you stop there, all of a sudden we've established this greater gift thing. Look, go back and see at the end of 12, the greater gift is faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of those is love. That's the greater gifts he's talking about operating in. But here he says, there's a greater thing that's happening in prophecy than tongues. But why? Why does he say that? Because the one who prophesies uh, is, um, greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so the church could be edified. In other words, what he's saying, when you prophesy, you're speaking in a language they understand. That's a greater deal that brings edification than speaking in tongues when they don't understand what you're saying. But he said it can be, tongues can be an edifying thing if it's interpreted. Stay with me. Because if you don't speak in tongues yet, chill out. Chill out. Listen to me. I became a born again believer at 20 years old. I walked an aisle at eight, but I figured it out at 20. A born-again believer, believing in the gifts of the Spirit, even though my domination didn't teach it, believing in it, did not speak in tongues for 30 years. 30 years of believing in something, but not able to operate in it. And you say, well, what's the deal if he wants us all to? Why would it be withheld? I think for me, it was withheld for the purpose of revive. I think he said, I got a plan for you and I'm going to baptize you in the spirit and you're going to start teaching this stuff. Can you wait 30 years? I wouldn't ask you to. So let's review what he said up to this point. If you speak in tongues, you're not speaking to men, but to God. No one will understand your tongues. Your spirit, small s, is speaking mysteries. And when you do this, you're building yourself up. He goes on to say that unless that tongue is interpreted, it doesn't edify anybody because they don't know what you're saying. But notice that prophecy edifies people because they know what you're saying. And then we come down to maybe the beginning of an understanding of what is going on because what we see in churches and this tongue things that just edifies you and nobody, they start coming together in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, for if I pray in a tongue, everybody say pray. Pray. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. In other words, when I'm using this language, it's not my soul. My spirit is praying. It's actually got cooperation of my body because my body is speaking out what my spirit is praying. But my mind is unfruitful. This is where I struggled with this for a long time. I would even tell my kids when I was younger, why in the world would God want you to pray something that you don't even know what you're praying? Who knows what you're praying? You could be praying something completely wrong. You can't. He says, when I pray in tongues, my mind doesn't know what I'm saying. What's the outcome then? In other words, what am I going to do about the fact that when I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but my mind doesn't know what I'm saying. Here's what he says I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with the spirit and I'll pray with my mind. I'm going to sing with the spirit 
and I'll sing with my mind also. In other words, he's saying, since I don't know what I'm saying when I'm in the spirit, I'm going to pray stuff that I know I'm saying, and I'm going to let my spirit pray what my spirit wants to pray, even though I don't understand what my spirit is praying. I'll just do both. He says he prays in tongues. He also says he does not know what he's saying when he's praying in tongues. Therefore, he will pray in tongues and in his own language. That's a huge point. Paul prays in tongues, but he does not say, it's important, he does not say my prayer in tongue needs to be interpreted. So he's praying in tongues, but there's no interpretation. That's going to throw some of you for a minute. But there's no interpretation. Why? Because he's praying in his spirit. Keep reading. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say amen? What's the ungifted? It's the person that doesn't have the gift of interpretation. You're praying in the spirit. They don't have the gift of interpretation. They don't know when to say, amen, buddy. I'm glad you said that. Speak it out. Yeah, I'm with you on that. They won't know when because you're praying in this language. They don't understand and they don't have the gift of interpretation. Since he does not know what you're saying for your giving thanks but the other person isn't edified. Edification for the common good. Stay with me. He is saying someone else is with you when you pray, then pray in the language they understand. Come on. He doesn't say, go ahead and pray in the spirit and get it interpreted for them. He says, if you're with someone else, pray in their language so that they understand and they can come into agreement with you and they can say amen. He doesn't say don't pray in tongues. He says if someone's with you, pray in a language they understand. Now remember the context of what he's talking about in this section of scripture is when to pray in tongues and when to pray in your language. He says, when I pray, I'm edifying myself and my mind doesn't understand. So I'm going to pray in the spirit and in my mind. But when I'm with somebody else, I'm going to pray in their language so that they can be edified, so that they can join me in that prayer. So the entire conversation up to this point says, I pray in tongues. I sing in tongues. I'm speaking to God, not to man. This is to build me up. But if I'm praying with someone else, I should pray in the common language. Then he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. In other words, Paul says, I speak in tongues a lot. Like, how could he have known how much each of them speak in tongues? But he said, this is what I do know. I pray in tongues more than you do. I speak in tongues more than you do. And then something happens in Scripture that I believe has completely messed up the church on this topic. Because there's a a little set of words here that changes the dynamic. It changes the direction. It changes what he's talking about. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church. Now, let's just stop right there for a moment. Up to this point, he has never said anything about in church. He's talked about his own prayer life and when he prays in the tongues and when he doesn't. And he said, if anybody's with me, I make sure and pray in the language they can understand. Then he says, however, forgetting all of that that I just said, not forgetting it, but let's let's put that on a shelf for a moment by by praying and praying with someone else. In the church, when we assemble together, I desire to speak five words with my mind in the language you know so that I can instruct others. It's called the common good rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. This is huge in this scripture. He has just changed the topic from when to pray in tongues and when to pray in the common language to what are we going to do in church? How is this going to work in church? Now remember, we went back and in the list of gifts, he said the gifts are for the common good. Now we're in the common crowd. He said the gifts are for the common good. So how can praying in tongues be for the common good? Paul says if he is praying in tongues, he's praying not to man, but he's praying to God. So Paul prays in tongues, but it's not for the common good. But in the list, it says that the gift of tongues is a gift for the common good. So hear me out. Tongues in prayer are for the edification of the person praying. My spirit prays. I'm speaking to God, not to men. I'm being edified. But the gift of tongues, which comes with interpretation, is for the common good. So when we get into the 
common arena, the common good arena, we're talking about the gift of tongues with interpretation. There are two different tongues he's talking about here. Not two different languages, but two different uses. He's saying, I have a prayer that I pray in tongues, and I do it in my spirit, and it edifies me, even though I don't know what I'm saying. But when I get into the arena of the common good, we're going to pray in tongues. I mean, we're going to speak in tongues, but we're going to have interpretation. Let me show that to you. So he's going to address how to use it. However, in the church, so we got the new topic. He says, therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues and an ungifted man or an unbeliever enters, will they not say you're mad? If you're Baptist, they will. (laughs) I can say that because I was raised in Baptist church. Now, listen, here's what he's addressing. Just think about this from a standpoint of what's going on in a church. If a person walked in that back door and everybody in this room was speaking in tongues and they were ungifted or an unbeliever. Think about that. Ungifted means I don't have this gift. I cannot interpret. I don't know what you're saying. An unbeliever hasn't even been released in his spirit to work in these kind of things. So he just hears a whole bunch of people talking in a whole bunch of different languages. And he says, these people are crazy. They all get together and they just all speak in a whole bunch of different languages. But listen to me. If that same person walked in the door, And this man got up right here and he began to say something in a language nobody understood. But this lady right here stood up and told us what he said. That man coming in would say, oh, I get it. He speaks a language I don't know, but she knows his language and mine and she can tell me what he said. That's what Paul is saying here. That they're going to think you're crazy if they're coming in. Everybody's speaking. He's basically saying, don't speak all in tongues at once because... The unbeliever and the ungifted are then drawn away from the things of the Spirit. Now they think the things of the Spirit are crazy instead of, wow, what an amazing gift. Now he goes on to talk about prophecy and how we use it, but I'm staying on tongues today. So when you're assembled, tongues and interpretation go together, and this is not prayer. This is what we use when we assemble. In 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, so now he's about to say in the church, if anyone speaks in a tongue, It should be by two or at the most three and each in turn and one must interpret. That's just straight up practical. Let's do it one at a time. If five of you are talking five different languages, I don't know what anybody's saying. But if one of you speaks a different language and one of you interprets, we all get edified because now all of us know what you said. And he said, but in 28, if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. In the church I grew up with, this was the big club. This was the big club. There's no interpretation. You can't speak in tongues in church. If somebody spoke in tongues and there was no interpretation, we got to run them out of here. That's not right. I've had people leave this church and tell me they left this church because during worship, someone was praying in tongues and nobody interpreted. So this is not a scriptural church. You know what my response to them was? God bless you. Keep studying. Wherever you go, God bless you. Keep studying. Keep studying because you're missing the character and the point of this entire discussion by trying to lay a rule down on it. And here was the rule. Keep it silent because if there's no interpretations, there's no tongues in church. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there will be tongues in church, but it needs to be done in such a way that everybody is edified. And the only way everybody can be edified is if we interpret it. But listen to me, that's the gift of tongues and interpretation. Let me put it to you this way. If we were all in worship like we were a few minutes ago and somebody three spaces down from you, man, they had their hands out like then they were saying, God, you're just awesome. And I just love you. And I thank you for your love for me and the way you've taken care of me. Well, everybody else is singing a song and they're doing that. And what are you thinking? That's awesome, man. They're just praising God. They're just worshiping away. But if they're standing over there speaking in a tongue, we want to say, wait, stop, stop. There's supposed to be interpretation. You can't do that in here. No, they're praying. They're worshiping God. Leave them alone. How do I know the difference? 
Because if that someone who is, is trying to get everybody to stop to listen to what they're doing, then that either is the gift or not the gift. So watch this, man, this is so important. So he says, if someone gets up and they speak in a tongue in your church service, why does he tell them to keep silent if there is no interpretation? That's when he says, be silent. If you spoke out, let's be practical. How are we going to know if we have an interpreter if nobody speaks out? So there's got to be a speak out. But once the speak out happens, now we're going to say, is there an interpretation? Listen, if there is an interpretation, it is the gift of tongues with interpretation. Watch, if there is no interpretation, then someone is speaking out in their prayer language. And this is what he says to them. Read it in the scripture. I'm not making this up. This is what he says. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent. Go on. What does it say after that? And let him speak to himself and to God. Wait a minute. What was prayer in tongues? Speaking to God, not to man. So he didn't tell him to stop in tongues. He said, be silent and continue to pray in tongues. But what you just did was not the gift of tongues interpretation. It wasn't meant for the common good. So this becomes sometimes the thing that brings about craziness. Craziness, and what I'm saying is craziness, for those of us who didn't grow up in a charismatic environment, who don't understand it, it's like, why does that person just yell that out? And then we look for an interpreter. It doesn't make it. And he's saying, hey, if it's the gift of tongues, there's going to be an interpreter. And if it was not, if it was your prayer language, then he's going to say, sit down and just pray, but don't stand up and try to get everybody to stop and interpret what you've just said. For one speaks in a tongue, does not speak to men, but God. So I hope you see how the previous conversation that Paul was having before he said, however, in the church was about praying. It was about praying in tongues and that he does that. But if someone's with him, he chooses not to. But then he says in the church, it works like this. If someone speaks out, there has to be an interpreter. If there's not an interpreter, they're speaking out in their prayer language. Tell them to sit down because that's not the gift. But if they get up and they speak in their language, there should be an interpretation. If there's an interpretation, that's the gift. And that's a blessing for the common good. He finishes with this. Therefore, my brethren... Desire earnestly to prophesy, because it's in their language and it'll edify them. And do not forbid to speak in tongues. Now, how can a guy who doesn't want tongues in the church say, don't forbid speaking in tongues? I grew up in a church that forbade speaking in tongues. I said this, I think, on a Wednesday night, so let me say it here. There's some crazy teaching out there. One of the crazy teaching is you got to be careful with that tongues thing because you could get tongues of the devil. And you could be speaking out evil. Go back and read what the scripture says. Knock and he'll open the door. Seek and you'll find. Ask and it be given to you. Listen, listen to what he says. For what father of you, if his son ask him for a fish would give him a snake. If he asked for a stone, would give him a scorpion. Now listen, what are snakes and scorpions in scripture? Demonic. They're always demonic. Snakes and scorpions are demonic. What is that scripture saying? If you ask the father, he's not going to give you something demonic. As a matter of fact, what he says is he will give you the Holy Spirit. So we leave it in God's hands that we're earnestly asking, can we have this this language, and we know that it's not demonic because he says, if you ask me, I will not give you anything demonic. Now, now that I've made those of you who grew up like me in a traditional church environment nervous, but how's all this tongue thing going to work? Let me go ahead and make the charismatics nervous for a moment. Because I grew up in the Bible, not in a charismatic church. I'm not saying those are against each other. But I was sitting right there where you are. I was sitting right there. There was a movie showing on the screen. This was four years ago. And I was asking God, why? Why would you take 
a church of Christ, Baptist, born and raised guy, baptize him in the spirit and put him over a charismatic church so that everybody can tell me how I'm doing it wrong. And the movie I was watching was called Holy Ghost. And R.T. Kendall said, there's been a divorce between the word of God and the spirit of God. And those things need to be put back together in the church. And when that was said in that blessed chair you're sitting in right there, it was like the Holy Spirit backed up with a dump truck and just low. I hit the floor in tears and he said, that's why I picked you. Here's the problem that brings to the table. I don't really understand a lot of the charismatic tradition. Thank God. <laughs> Stay calm, Tim. This is what I do know. There are two things that drive me right now. One is the assignment to bring the word of God and the Spirit of God back together, okay? But inside of that, number two is helping people who grew up in the environment I grew up in accept the things of the Spirit. In other words, sometimes you got to tell the charismatic group, can you guys slow down? We don't know what you're doing. And we have to tell the traditional group, can you guys just accept this is in the Bible and it's okay to do? And so tongues becomes one of those things that the traditional group is like, what? And the charismatic group is like, oh, yeah. I'll give you an example, just one example. What's the outcome, brethren, in verse 26? When you assemble in the church, one has a song, one has a teaching, one has a revelation, one has a tongue, one has an interpretation. So people will come to the church with a song, a teaching, a revelation, and a tongue. But why is it in church, in a charismatic environment, that the only one of those things that gets spontaneous delivery is tongues? Why do we believe that if someone's going to speak in tongues, it's going to be spur of the moment, out of nowhere, that person's going to speak in tongues, everybody's got to stop, and we got to look at this. So all I'm saying is, when I read this scripture, some come with a song, some come with a teaching, some come with a revelation. Now, here's the problem I have. Either we're completely doing church wrong, and what we're actually supposed to do is gather together and wait till something spontaneous happens, a song, a teaching, or whatever. I got a real issue with how do we have spontaneous teaching? I don't even know you. I don't even know if you're a believer and you're going to stand up and teach the group. So I come with a teaching. I've been studying for weeks. I come with a teaching. My daughter comes with songs. She's already practiced a band and given them songs. Oftentimes, someone who comes in with a prophetic word will tell me in advance, man, I got a word this week for the church. Can I give it? Sure. Sometimes during the service, they will come up to me. Today, Dominic Ditcherlisi came to me and said, God is calling forth the daughters of this church. That's why I did what I did, because there was a prophetic word to do it. But you'll notice it was completely done in order. He came and gave me the word. I delivered the word. We had the moment, okay? And so what I'm asking is, why is tongues different? Why does tongues have to be spontaneously delivered? Because every charismatic I've talked to is, oh, when somebody rips out, man, you got to get everybody quiet so we can hear them and see if there's an interpretation. I'm saying, why is it done that way? Because nothing else is done that way. Even Jesus, when he was in the tabernacle, he didn't stand up and say, I got something to teach y'all. It says he went up and he stood at the podium and he unrolled the scroll and he taught from the scroll and he said, today this is happening in your presence. So I'm asking as a non-charismatically grown up person, grown up and not charismatically grown up, <laughs> why does it have to be spontaneous? Why, why couldn't a person with the gift of tongues come and say, I have something I'm supposed to deliver? Okay, let's let you deliver it and see if there's an interpretation. Okay, because when you deliver that and we get an interpretation, it's a beautiful thing. Everybody's edified by it, and they think that's cool. Wow, tongues make sense now. Now, I'm not saying it cannot be spontaneous. I think sometimes we're in a service, especially this one here, my daughter, spontaneously sings a lot. 
she gets something and, and she begins to sing it out, but it's in order and we follow her and, and it's, it's in the moment. So what I'm saying is I think part of the scary for most people who did not grow up charismatic is actually the tradition of how tongues is delivered in a service, that it has to be spontaneous as you random. I'm just asking the question, does it have to be? Because I think tongues should be in the church. I'm declaring to you today that I want to understand how tongues and interpretations are used in the church in a church service. But don't, don't be upset with me if I question the traditional way it's been done and say, why is it done that way? I don't understand. Now, maybe it'll be done that way and we'll all understand at one moment. Uh, listen, I'm not saying tongues can't be spontaneous. The scriptural basis for tongues being spontaneous would actually be the day of Pentecost. They were sitting in an upper room. A wind came in. Tongues of fire on their head, and they all start talking another language. That's pretty spontaneous. And I'm just telling you, if a wind comes in here, and there's fire on everybody's head, I'm hitting the floor. (laughs) Because all rules are off then. God can do it however he wants to do it. I want to understand the rightful use of this gift in the church because it's supposed to edify us, and we're missing out on an opportunity to be edified because we're squabbling over how to do it. Let me give you one more thing and we'll leave. (laughs) I told the first service and I'll tell you. For those of you that I'll never see again, God bless you. God bless you. All I'm trying to do is pull out the scripture and let the spirit move and figure out how to do this, okay? So you can bear with me or you can go somewhere that does it the way you say it's supposed to be done. Now, last comment. This was the problem for me, and I believe it's the problem for the majority of the people who don't speak in tongues. Listen to me. Don't stress over this. Don't worry about this. I gave up on it and tried again and gave up on it and tried again for 30 years. Now, here's the thing that's the most trouble with understanding can you speak in tongues or not. It is not a product of your mind. It is not a product of your mind. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I sit down and say, should I say somebody bought a Honda? (laughs) I've just thought through what I'm going to say. So what I said, I'm sorry. (laughs) What I thought through came from my mind. It did not come from my spirit. And so the question is, well, how do you release yourself to let the Spirit speak? you got to be out of your mind. you got to be out of your mind. And listen, I'm a thinker. I'm a strategist. I'm a studier. This was the hardest thing for me. How do I stop thinking and let something flow out of me? I didn't know. I got baptized in the Spirit five years ago. Three months later, when I thought all this should be here because I got baptized, right? I'm still not speaking in tongues. So I'm out on my back patio and I'm having my morning devotion. I'm just saying, God, this is supposed to be available to me, but I don't know how to make it happen. He said, right. So I began to worship. I put some music on and I opened my mouth and a language came out that was beautiful. Listen, let me tell you what happens so that you can stop doing this. As soon as something comes out of your mouth, say, this is ridiculous. I'm just doing this. I'm just making this happen. Listen, give it a chance. Let it go. Even if you think you're just being foolish, let it flow. Why? Because in about two and a half minutes, I was flowing in a language, saying words I've never said before in complete conjunctive sentences that had a rhythm and a rhyme that I knew I was speaking a language. I didn't even have to think about it. It just came out. It's like my spirit was saying, you've been praying out of your soul for 30 years. Shut up and give me a chance. And The things to remember from today. Praying in tongues is your spirit praying. 
Scripture says we can pray in tongues because we have a spirit that has been brought to life. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, but you have been made alive in Christ. So your spirit can, and I believe your spirit wants to, pray. And you're allowed to pray in tongues in church. It's the legalist and the ones that don't understand that want to put a stop to that because they don't understand that you're praying in tongues and it's not meant for interpretation. But we will have to step into how does it work for real? Maybe it works once a year, maybe once a quarter, maybe once a month. Maybe somebody's going to say, man, I got something and it's in tongues. Okay, let's go. Let's see. Let's see if we got an interpreter. Oh, we got an interpreter. Oh my goodness. That was beautiful what you just said. And we'll understand how this thing works. But what I need us to do is chill out. (laughs) Listen, this is not a place to die. This is not a place to fall on your sword. This is not a place to do battle. This is a place of understanding. It's a place of looking at the scripture. And the scripture says this should be part of our life. So how do we make it part of our life? Withstanding what we've been taught maybe in the past. Withstanding some of the traditional ways of doing things. And just getting back to the core of what is it and how does it work and how do I release myself into it. I know it's a struggle, man. For some of you who don't pray in tongues, I know it's a struggle. It was for me for so long. But then God just released it. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a very helpful thing. And I've, I told the first group, and I'll tell you, anytime, anytime I'm down, anytime I'm frustrated, anytime I'm just really battling and not knowing what to do, I come right in here. I turn these little tulip lights on. I put a little music on back there, and I march back and forth, and I pray in tongues. And when I pray in tongues for about 30 minutes, by the end of that, I walk out of here ready to take on anybody and anything. And I'm happy to say, I don't understand what I said. (laughs) And what I've learned is I don't need to know. I just know what it does to me. It builds me up. So some of you are sitting there thinking, is he about to make us all a try to speak in tongues? (laughs) No. You want me to tell you why? Because when you get in a group like this, and you go for a baptism of the spirit, or you go for tongues, or you go for whatever, there's so much pressure on the people that don't. They're like, everybody's going to be looking at me. Everybody's going to want to know if I did. And I'm so stressed out right now, but am I doing this right? And can I do it? I don't know if I can do it. And then there's like an accounting at the end of the day. Well, I guess I failed because I didn't, but I heard that lady did. I don't know why she did not. It's just miserable. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go home. I want you to get in your closet, in your bedroom. I want you to get in whatever worship moment works for you, whether that's music or silence or whatever. And I want you to say, God, how do I get this? How does this release to me? What what can I do? And then stop telling yourself it's not real. Okay. (laughs) I I got got one more confession to make and then I'm done. The reason I said two and a half minutes in, I began fluently speaking in a language Because for the first two minutes, I was trying to make up a language. I was. I I was in my own mind. Give me something here. And at about the two and a half minute mark, everything just changed. I think it was God saying, man, you want this so bad. I'm just going to give it to you. And a whole new vocabulary came out. It wasn't anything like I was doing for the first two minutes. It was completely different. And then I knew this is it. This is the language I'm to pray in. Church, it's not crazy. It's part of who we are. It's biblical. It's part of what we use. It's part of our experience. It's just one. It's it's just one. Prophesying is one. Faith is one. Giving is one. Healing is one. They're all different kind of things we work in for the common good. So I want you to go home today and just say, this ain't crazy. It's okay. We can use this. Father God, we love you. I thank you, God that we're just digging into the word, trying to understand it. God, I see the benefits. I see the way with prophecy that you edify other people. I want to see how you do it with tongues. I see the strength there is for me personally in my prayer time. I bless everyone in here who does not currently pray in tongues to just step out of their mind for a moment. And let their spirit pray in their private time, at home, 
with you. I thank you, God, that we're just pursuing truth. We're asking questions to some degree, God, in the holiest of ways. We're debating back and forth for better understanding. I pray that we've released some truth today, some level of understanding that would allow us to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.